Hi there, Scott Hamilton, Rockfile, back with another podcast. We're not going to call this a review, but it's a podcast for your ears. Talking about the new Porcupine Tree album, Closure, Continuation. I'll give the short version up front. This is not an album you will listen to once and go, yeah, that was great. It is an album that will reveal itself to you on multiple listens. And as such, I think it's one of the best albums of their career. So to dig into it, this is not going to be a review where I talk song by song or pick apart the musicians or all that kind of stuff. We're going to give you basically my general thoughts after a week of listening to the album from someone who is a diehard fan. If you are new to prog rock or new to Porcupine Tree, I don't know that I would start here. But I've read a, a lot of reviews. I stayed away from reviews. I stayed away from even listening to the songs that were released beforehand. Kind of like not watching movie trailers before you watch a movie. I really wanted the full album experience. I ordered a copy of the album. Well, first of all, I've pre-ordered the box set because I have all of the other Stephen Wilson and Porcupine Tree box sets and I wasn't going to miss one. But I also pre-ordered a, an iTunes version because they were going to release the singles as the band was releasing them. And not knowing if I was going to get any kind of record label support on this album, which I didn't get any, um, that would be the only way I could get songs from my progressive rock radio station on the internet. So as the songs were released, I listened to them and went, okay, it's new Porcupine Tree. I thought Herod and pretty much sounded like solo Stephen Wilson. And I didn't listen to it over and on repeat. I didn't want to get tired of one song because it was months before I was going to get the album. Um, on a new day, whatever the second track is, um, thought that was wonderful. That was more of what I wanted. Really dug it. And we'll get into the whole wanting thing out of a new album. And then the third track was recently released, Rats Return, which I liked. But again, none of these tracks I burned a disc, I put in my car, I listened to them a few times, I watched the videos a couple times, and that was really it. I didn't get into this. And and you would think somebody for a, a, who's a fan, band hasn't released music in over 10 years, 11 years, almost 12 years. Um, you'd think I'd be diehard, you know, jonesing to hear new stuff from them. I'm a big Stephen Wilson fan. All right. I discovered the band on In Absentia right before Dead Wing came out. A friend of mine gave me a copy of In Absentia and it stayed in my car for a year. I had gone very far away from my progressive rock roots. I still listen to Rush and Yes and things like that, but I wasn't finding new bands in that genre. I was very much into mainstream radio and didn't have time, to be perfectly honest. And when Porcupine Tree released In Absentia, I was living on Grand Cayman Island, so even less of an opportunity there to be exposed to it. But it was on a major Atlantic Records or a division of Atlantic Records, and, and it was a pretty major release for them. So anyway, when I got back to the States, a friend of mine gave me a copy of the album, um, and I absolutely fell in love with it. And about that time, they released Dead Wing. So I saw the band live. I, I followed them around on several shows on Dead Wing. I followed a whole leg of the Fear of a Blank Planet tour, um, and I saw them on The Incident. And then I've seen Stephen Wilson on all of his solo tours. And finally, after 10 years of trying, I get to interview Stephen Wilson. And I'll talk about that as we go on, too. So I've had a, a, a 20 year almost love affair with this band and this artist. And I'm pretty well versed. I own his side projects from Blackfield to Bass Communion to some of the other stuff, uh, the OEM, the German Krautrock stuff. I mean, really, I got heavily into it. And some of it I like, some of it, the ambient stuff I can take or leave. I like a little more mellow type ambient music than some of the stuff he produced. Um, I thought that stuff was okay. I, I really like Blackfield. I really like No Man. I really like some of the other things he's done. Um, I like the song he did with um, Marius from Riverside. But like I said, when Harriton first came out, I, it really sounded like a track that was off one of Stephen Wilson's solo albums. And, and that was shortchanging it. A lot of people on the internet and reviews I've read have dismissed this album pretty quickly. I mean, really quickly, actually. And I think most of that stems from, an, and many people will say this about just about everything, movies or whatever. Are you letting your expectations get in the way of actually evaluating something? Our expectations for a movie when we really like the trailer and we really want the movie to be good. You don't watch the movie with the same brain the same glasses on 
that you watch, you saw a trailer, you weren't really into it. Somebody's making you watch it and it's okay. You know, there's, there's a variety of ways to expose yourself to art and expectation is a killer, especially with things that are artistic, that are evolving, that are different bands and artists and, and directors that strive to do different things. They don't always get it right and they don't, I'm not always thrilled with them, but I applaud the attempt because it's very easy to do more of the same, to do a sequel to something, to do, well, they like this, let me give them more of that. Stephen Wilson has told me personally and many people that he just doesn't like repeating himself. And I appreciate that about his art. I don't connect with all of his solo stuff as much as I did with most of the Porcupine Tree stuff, but I all res- I respect it because it's good music. So not looking forward to Porcupine Tree was just the, the, the first songs I heard. were They just didn't light me on fire. But I guess I was listening for A Blackest Eyes, A Trains, A Fear of a Bank Planet. I was, you know, I was listening for a particular sound. So the album finally, I live in Alaska time. So 8 p.m. on Thursday night was midnight Eastern and the album downloaded into my iTunes. I quickly burned it to a disc and for the last week I've had it in my car. I've tried to listen to it before bed. I've tried to listen to it as a whole experience and we'll get into a little bit about the box set too. Sorry if this gets a little long. Um, so I've spent a lot of time with it and I'm listening to the 10 track version. The album has seven tracks. And the iTunes version and the box set come with three bonus tracks plus a lot of instrumental tracks. So the disc I burned for my car is the seven tracks from the main album and the three bonus tracks, which as par for the course for most of Stephen Wilson's bonus tracks, they're as good or almost as good as anything on the album and probably should have been left on. That's how I feel about a lot of his bonus tracks. Everything from... um, Drown With Me from In Absentia. That was left off the album and it's become a big song for them. There's a lot of those in their catalog, actually. So listening to the album on repeat, Harridan makes more sense. Uh, On a New Day makes more sense. Rat's Return now makes more sense as part of the collective whole. And the more I listened and the more I grew to love this album, I realized what the real problem is here. We are used to Porcupine Tree, during their biggest time, releasing an album about every two years. Two to three. I mean, there was always an album. They would tour for a little while and play parts of the album before it came out or play the full album. And then once the album came out, they would do a proper tour, mix the album in with other songs. And they were on a pretty regular schedule, and then they just stopped. And Stephen Wilson said in an interview with me and other people that he was pretty much done with the band and that we pretty much thought it was over. He says now that he was just saying that. And, and I get why he would. Uh, at first, I was like, really? But no, I mean, if, if you're pushing your solo project and you're... He said in the, when I finally interviewed him a few years ago, he said the same year he released The Incident from Porcupine Tree in his first solo album, Insurgentes. And he enjoyed the solo album more. So that told him what he needed to do going forward. Now, there's also people hanging on the fact that we're missing a member. That Colin Edward is not on the, on the album. And they recently came out and kind of explained. Now, I'm friends with Colin on Facebook. And so I keep up with all these guys. I'm friends with all these guys on Facebook. I've talked to all of them personally. I, I can't say I'm close with like Richard um, or even Gavin for that matter. But I've exchanged emails and conversations with Stephen Wilson and Colin and John Wesley even. And to hear them tell it, Colin just didn't stay up with them. When when Porcupine Tree was done, they weren't done. Stephen would go over to Gavin's house. Gavin would go over to Stephen's house. Richard would come over. They would play some tunes. And they, would, they worked on these things for over a decade. Porcupine Tree never had that luxury to work on songs for more than a year. More than They sent things back and forth for six months or a year. And then the album would come out. They wouldn't even record in the same place. I mean, they did for In Absentia, and I, did, I think they did for a while because uh, big record label money and such, but I think they've gone back the other way now. So they worked on this music longer than anything else they've ever produced. So you've been in a band for 10, 15, 20 years. You've been a musician for 20, 25, 30 years, and you get a decade to work on seven songs. <laughs> 
they come out as exactly as they want them as I think they did. You know what I mean? I mean, there's people, and I hate to be that guy, get off my lawn, but it's young people mostly who listen to a song once or an album once and disregard it. In my interview with Stephen Wilson, he joked about the fact that when digital became a thing, when Napster and all that were going on, it changed music because a kid could download the entire Beatles catalog from LimeWire or whatever, listen to one song, not like it, and delete the entire catalog and never listen to anything else and never respect it. Didn't buy the album, take it out of the plastic, put it on the record player, listen to it, read the lyrics. Didn't buy the CD, take it out of the plastic, put it in the CD player, listen, you know, listen to it and read the lyrics and look through the booklet and all that kind of stuff. Things became digital and music became very disposable. And so a lot of these reviews I've seen online, these are people who have fringe fans, haven't been a fan very long, don't really like the band in the first place, and they're they're pissing on the album and it's like I don't know why I'm listening to you. The internet's given everybody an opinion. And I've said in previous podcasts that the only reason I talk about this stuff is because I have decades of experience and, and, and know that uh, my opinion does count for something, that I program million-dollar radio stations and they make money and, and, and do promotions and people listen to them. So there is, a, there is a method to my madness and why I make some of the decisions I make are based on actual evidence I've, I've I work in the radio industry for 37 years. Come on. You'll learn a few things about music. I was a trumpet player before that. I can read music. I can write music. Stephen Wilson can't even do that, he said. Told me that. I actually impressed him more than once in our interview day, and it was a big deal for me. Um, So the album, not to get way off the topic, didn't have Colin in it because... Well, when Gavin and Steven were just playing around, he picked up a bass and was slapping on it and playing around with it. And that just kind of led to the recording of the album. And so it was the core of the three of them. And some people have mentioned John Wesley, but John Wesley's always been a touring member. I mean, they use his backing vocals on some albums and things, but I don't think he was ever a, uh, he's never been considered or even, I think himself considered himself a member of the band. There's two new guys going to be on tour. I'm friends with one of them. Um, they said they're, they were part of the touring band. You know, we didn't play on the album, that kind of thing. I'm fine with that. But people who are like, well, it's it's missing, so it's missing a person. Well, Colin it was a, it, is a really nice guy and a fantastic bass player. But saying one bass player in a band that's pretty much run by the guy who writes all the songs and... As amazing as he is, if he wasn't present for any of the recording of these songs, why are we lamenting the fact that he's not on there? This has given Richard Barbieri and Gavin Harrison more room to fill in those holes. I mean, there's bass playing on, and it's good. Steven played, I think, on the entire album. He got some, maybe enlisted some help, and obviously he's not going to play it on tour. He says he's not that good a bass player. But from the soundscapes to the interplay with the percussion, um, to the songwriting in general, I was even too dismissive of this album. It's an amazing piece of work. I mean, it. I don't know that I will listen to anything else this year that even comes close to being the album of the year. This is not just my opinion talking. I'm a, I'm a fan of the band, and it doesn't tick all my porcupine tree boxes. There's no arriving somewhere but not here on here. That's one of my favorite songs of all time from the band or Trains or whatever. Some of the older songs, "Stupid" from Stupid Dream or Lightbulb Sun. There's not really a whole lot. But what I do hear on here are little tiny pieces of glimpses. Call it memories. Call it fragments of previous albums or songs. There's a little thing in here, whether it be a lyric or a riff. And then it'll play it and you go, that sounds kind of familiar. And then it goes away. It becomes something else. It grows. It evolves. It it changes. Um and so I think that's where we get the title, the closure continuation. They hadn't put out an album in over a decade, almost 12 years. So it, they wanted a question, I think, in the, in the people's minds. Is this the last thing they, they, they worked on this for 10 years and this kind of continues and closes it? Or does this close off the previous and move forward with the continuation of what is to come? I honestly think they'll do more. I've watched some of these interviews now that I've listened to the album. I've tried to stay away from any kind of spoiler stuff before I listen to it. They seem very happy to be working together. They're treating it like they should. Um, this is more of a band thing than he's ever done. Usually when Porcupine Tree was interviewed for stuff, it was still just Steven, which is funny. Now all three of them are showing up for things. That's kind of cool. 
I was at the uh, in-store recording for um, We Lost the Skyline in that record store in Orlando that they squeezed 300 of us in there. Porcupine Tree was supposed to play. It was supposed to be a full band thing, and there wasn't room, so it was just Stephen with the guitar, and John Wesley came out and helped a couple times. They had never done anything like that, but it was interesting to talk to them afterwards. They still, while they feel like a band, they felt like you know individuals for the most part. And they're talking as a collective unit now, which is really cool. Maybe it's they've had 10 years of out being out of the public eye, but they've become closer friends, maybe. When I interviewed Stephen many, many years ago, not many, but it was like eight years ago, he said he was better solo than in a band. Because in a band, you have to make certain sacrifices. You, you make compromises. He says, as a solo artist with a band, they play what I tell them to play, and I, you know, I get what I want. But it seems like he's appreciating the collaboration this time more than any other time I've seen. So the album has that ebb and, ebb and flow that most Porcupine Tree albums have. Um, I think seven is too short. I think they should have put the 10 on there, but a 46-minute album in these days is kind of rare and kind of cool. When it's over, you want more. That's a good sign of a good album or a good movie. The best sign for a good album or a good movie is it takes me more than one time to really appreciate it. Some of my favorite movies of all time, I didn't really appreciate the first time I saw them. I kind of liked it, but it was over my head or uh, I just needed to know more to fully appreciate it. This is one of those albums. It, 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 there's a little gentle giant in here. There's a little old Genesis in here. There, there, it's, this is their, <laughs> funny to say about the band who kind of re-brought progressive rock back to the forefront of music over the last 20 years, but this is their most proggy album. It, I mean, you got some long prog songs that totally, totally almost, hmm, how shall I say, almost stereotypical prog trips, but then end in something different, somewhere different. It's really an amazing piece of work that can surprise even me, who's a fan of the band, who's a fan of music, who's been in the music industry for almost 40 years. It's if I'm surprised by something and pleasantly surprised, pleased by something that it, it, it takes a right or a left turn that I didn't expect, or I'm used to the mellow to bombastic uh, uh, sound design that Stephen Wilson prefers for Porcupine Tree. They do a lot of, we're going to be down here and then we're going to take it to this level. And that's very emotional and impactful. And I get it. Those moments I expected, I didn't expect some of the other stuff. Really layered harmony. He's been mixing, messing with harmonies since the late 90s, but really nice layered harmonies in these songs. It's mostly his voice, but still. Um, there's a lot of standout moments. If you're a drummer, just listen to this album from start to finish. You get pretty much every kind of playing that Gavin Harrison can do. Jazzy stuff, rock and stuff, metal stuff. It, it, Tasteful stuff. It's all just really good. Richard Barbieri soundscapes. He's adding color to these songs. He's adding things that aren't in just the chord progressions, that aren't just in the solos. And that's what he's always been brilliant at since he's been in the band. Didn't li didn't I didn't dislike this album, but I thought it was going to be one of those that I, I was cold from. And I did, those first songs kind of hit me cold, especially Harridan. It really hit me cold. Um, and I'm very passionate about this band, so it was that was a weird feeling. I crank it up now. Now that I've heard it in context with the whole album, I've let myself really listen to it and really get into it. It's not just, you know, it's it's more. There's more layers to this. There's more depth to this album. Again, they spent over a decade working on seven songs. Most artists spend that kind of time, and they didn't spend full time on it, obviously, but most artists spend that kind of time on stuff. The, the music comes out is overwrought, is overproduced, is too much. It's like, wow, too many cooks in the kitchen, too much time spent on the stove. It went bad. It's not the case with this album. It feels fresh. Like I said, there's pieces that sound like Porcupine Tree. There's a couple things that sound like Stephen Wilson. But for the most part, it sounds like a new album from these guys doesn't sound like a continuation of the incident or any of the previous albums. You have this time jump and you have all this Stephen Wilson solo music to fill up that space in between where he's stretched and grown and done different things. Very jazz leaning albums, very rock leaning albums, very mellow leaning albums, very concepty albums. You know, he's, he's kind of over the last 
12 years, kind of done whatever he's wanted with that solo career, pop album, you know? So to go back to this, and then it not, it would have been very easy to put out In Absentia Part 2, to do a Part 2 to Blackest Eyes or Arriving Somewhere from Deadwing. That would have been easy. The easy way out. But it's not. And the more I listen to it, the more I've fallen in love with it. I never thought it would be one of those car albums because it's got so many mellow parts, but it is. Maybe it's because I'm in Alaska now. So let's get some of those, uh, to some of those pros and cons. The pros is it's a new album from one of the best progressive rock bands on the planet. Um, and they're really trying something here. I think they are. It's good art. It's good work. I wish I could see the tour. I don't think it's going to happen. I'm going to try and make it happen, but I don't think it's going to happen. This will be the first Porcupine Tree tour I've missed since I got into the band, since the Deadwing days. So hopefully it doesn't, hopefully I can see it, but I'm a little far removed from most of their dates. I think they are playing Canada, something I could probably get to, but we'll see. Um, There are a few cons, but it's more in packaging in the box set. So if you buy the iTunes version, this won't apply to you. The iTunes version, by the way, is great. It's got the the full seven tracks of the album, three bonus tracks. The sound quality is very, very good. I burned it to a CD. Um, Great. It's Stephen Wilson's production. (laughs) He has progressed in all of his mixing, mastering, and surround sound work. So the album sounds incredible. The drums sound incredible. The keyboards sound incredible. The guitar tones are incredible. His voice goes through some different things. It's it's a, it's a solid production piece, right? So I got the box set. Now I have every Stephen Wilson and Porcupine Tree box set, those $100 deals. A big hardback book, you usually got four discs in there, you get the CD, you get a CD of bonus tracks, you get a DVD, and you get a Blu-ray usually. Um, the hardback books are nice. They look good on the shelf. I like having them all. I almost missed one one time. Had a buddy of mine in Ohio pick up copies. Oh, thank you for that. <laughs> um, and so I, I ordered this one without, you know, I didn't even give, give it much thought. It was cheaper than those. It was only about 45 bucks on a pre-order plus shipping. The others were, you know, 60, 70, 80 plus $20 of shipping from England. So this was a bit on the cheaper side. So it comes in and it's a good size. It's vinyl size. I didn't buy the vinyl. I bought the, the CD and Blu-ray edition. So the book is not hardback. It's paperback. It's a good book. The art design is very cool. It's got the lyrics in it. It's got some behind the scenes stuff. Well, not really behind the scenes stuff, but um, liner notes. It follows the artwork design of the entire album. It would be great if it was hardback, but it's fine as a paperback and it's good at quality. I mean, it's nice paper. My dad was in the printing business, so. The CDs come in the second thing that comes out, which is basically looks like a recycled um, vinyl cardboard holder. And instead, it's got artwork, some kind of abstract art with the three discs tucked into it. It's way oversized for having three discs in it. And these all fit into a nice heavy slip cover that's thinner than the previous box sets. Now, I didn't really complain so much when he started messing with different sizes. Like, all the stuff was the same size, but the incident is kind of different. And then, you know, he this is different. So, I would have paid an extra 20 bucks to have a hardback book. And put the CDs in there instead of the cardboard thing it's in. That thing's not going to hold up to taking those CDs in and out a lot. But I won't be. I'll be taking the Blu-ray out. On one of the previous sets, I actually bought the separate Blu-ray disc so I just wouldn't have to take the Blu-ray out all the time. Um, Pink Floyd announced they've got a box set coming out for animals finally. Uh, There's the $100 box set, but it's got vinyl in it. And it's great if you're a vinyl fan, but it's got vinyl and CD and Blu-ray and DVD in it. Why do you need all that? I, I don't even have a turntable. I don't care about vinyl. Put out a vinyl version, leave out the CDs, and put out a CD version and leave out the vinyl. Save the collectors a little bit of money. But anyway, I'll probably get the box set because I have all the other Pink Floyd box sets. I got this box set because I have other, every other Porcupine Tree box set. It's worth the money. For the content that I got in it, the book is nice and three CDs and all that for 45 bucks or whatever. Yeah, it was worth it. But I would have paid more to get the, the normal Stephen Wilson Porcupine Tree book treatment. I understand. This is released on Sony, Music for Nations label. Um, 
Maybe we'll blame them for some of the packaging designs. They just didn't want to go all the way with, I don't know. My biggest complaint, the CDs are great, by the way. Um, Labeling goes with the artwork of the rest of the stuff. The sound quality is perfect, of course. The Blu-ray. Pop the Blu-ray in. You get all the different mixes. You get a Dolby Atmos mix. You get a 5.1 surround sound mix. You get um, high-resolution mixes in stereo and surround sound. Uh, 9624, I think. I mean, really nice. Movies play while the songs play. So most of them are abstract. It doesn't put up the lyrics or anything like that. Some of these audio discs have. Um, but it's it's cool. It's nice to have on and watch. And So at the beginning, you choose whether tracks are the whole album and... and whether you want to want, want to watch the movies and you pick your mix. It has the seven songs and that's it. Now on the previous box sets, you get the bonus tracks, the instrumentals, the videos, and all of that on the disc as well. Now, from a artist and musical standpoint, if you just want to put the album on the disc and have that only be the thing on there, I get that. I do. And by the way, I'm not complaining about that. The the Dolby Atmos mix, I, tears came to my eyes. It sounds so good. He mixed some of those layered harmony vocals up in the ceiling, which is amazing. Kind of comes down on you like a heavenly choir. It really changes the sound of the album in a good way. It, it just makes it a lot more immersive. And it just sounds super clean and high resolution on my surround sound system. I got a nice clip system with an Akio receiver. It, it sounds really good, really clean. But I, I miss having the the three. It just I don't even need the instrumentals. But give me those three bonus tracks, so at least it's an hour long. And they've released videos. They couldn't put those on there too. I don't know. The package is good, but I'd have to give it three and a half to four stars instead of my usual five star that I give for all the other Stephen Wilson and Porcupine Tree packages because it's almost there. It's, it just feels like somebody else did this and they weren't involved, or maybe they were. Maybe the people they got to do the art and, and the package, this is what they wanted. It just seems like it has less. He's always included all the mixes and all the bonus tracks and all that stuff on the disc in high resolution if you wanted it. And I appreciate having all that content. This, while it's wonderful, it's 46 minutes and you listen to it and, and it's over. You know, I'm, I'm going to be spending the weekend going through the different mixes, listening to it, doing some real hardcore Sit down. I'm not going to do laundry or cook or talk to people on the phone. I'm going to sit and just listen to this album because I've got time. Fourth of July weekend's coming up. It's a very busy time here in the Kenai Peninsula. Um, I've been going out on weekends to different places like Seward and Homer and, and uh, Nanilchik and some of the other places around here to see Anchor Point, to see what I can see. But I'm not going to fight crowds, not that we have a lot of those, or traffic. We don't have the biggest road systems and if we get more people here the roads traffic gets a little hard to make a left-hand turn and things like that fortunately my house is near a red light and that kind of thing and I can get to work but um I've been on the go uh if you listen to a lot of my other podcasts for those new people here just to hear the porcupine tree I have done some Alaska experience podcasts and I'll talk all about how um this much light (laughs) having the sun up till midnight is a, a weird thing and everybody in Alaska go, go, goes this time of year. And I, I got to be honest, June, I was doing three to four live radio appearances a week. <laughs> and on weekends going to hike and stuff. I'm exhausted. It's June 30th as I record this and I'm tired. It's literally one week since I got the Porcupine Tree album digitally. During that week, I listened to it in my car. I got the album. I listened to the surround sound version. And to wrap everything up, I don't know where it falls on my list of favorite Porcupine Tree albums. It's easy when I get together with fans and go, my top three Rush albums, or put them in all in order, or Zeppelin, or Pink Floyd, or even Porcupine Tree. I'm really good about, hmm, well, my favorite album, probably in absentia because I got into them then, but I like Dead Wing and Fear of a Blank Planet too, and I, well, you know, those would be my top three. And this one, I don't know where it falls in yet. But right now, I honestly would tell you it's one of the best things they've ever done. It's not going to be the most popular thing. Uh, It's not mainstream in too many ways at all, actually. There are a couple nice songs that you could play for friends who are not into prog rock, and they go, oh, that's that's a pretty good song, you know. But there's nothing that's going to change them into diehard Porcupine Tree fans tomorrow, like 
I think Blackest Eyes is one of those songs. You can play that for anybody and they go, that's a pretty great rock song, you know. What does that band sound like? They've had some songs like that. I don't know how many are on here like that because there hasn't been one that's just kind of pulled me in. Now that I'm listening to the whole album, I really like Dignity and the other songs that I hadn't heard before. I can't say more than the first three. I'm just saying how it all fits together, the journey that it takes you on. I don't think it's a concept album of any kind other than the fact it feels like closure continuation. It feels like Porcupine Tree's been gone for 12 years and they're reminding you of what they did and where they're going. A lot of people are going to talk about Stephen Wilson's falsetto. He discovered this a few albums ago, and now he's using it all the time. I don't really have a problem with it because he's got a good falsetto, but it's not a way I would ever sing. I People, since he started doing it, oh, he's going pop or whatever. No, I just think he's trying to put some different elements in the songs. And when he and I did an interview, and we talked about the fact that he doesn't read music. He just sits down and, and gets out what's in his head. He finds the chords, and he makes it happen. Um you know, I, I somebody has to put a piece of music in front of me and I play it on the trumpet or the piano or whatever. It's a completely different way of, of approaching music. This feels like an album where they approached it from just, what do we want to do? Where do we want to take this song? Where do we want it to go? The, the, these songs, uh, uh, from what I've heard, all began as jam sessions, kind of, and they grew into what we have. That's organic. That's great. Um, and you work on something this long, what you release is going to be exactly what you want, whether the public's onto it or not. So some of the best albums of all time weren't the biggest hits and, and weren't mass appeal. There's, that doesn't make them any less great. This is really a subtly great work. It doesn't hit you over the head with greatness. It, it reveals itself. The more you listen, the more you go, Wow. I was really into that there for a second. You know, it takes you places. Good progressive rock does that. So I'll do a, a, a formal review where I talk about the songs or whatever a little bit later when I, I, I got to be honest with you, I don't even know all the song titles. When I play a, a CD in a car, look, I'm a radio guy and a song title is very important to me and how much intro there is and how the song ends, fades or cold or whatever. But when I listen to something personally, I don't want to get all into that. I want to just enjoy the music. And how I do that is like, don't put CD names or don't put song tracks on the CD and put it in and don't turn on my, my song track on my CD player. So it just track one, track two, track three. Sometimes I'll put albums on shuffle. I don't even want to hear them in the way that the album was sequenced by the producer or the, you know, the artist or whatever, because I just want to enjoy the music. So with this one, I haven't paid attention to the song titles. This is not a, 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 a too much of <laughs> Porcupine Tree songs don't usually have hooks and choruses so much. Um, well, I guess, you know, they do. But Porcupine Tree's always been the more mainstream of his output, if you could call it that. I guess No Man was a little bit more mainstream. But this is, to me, as artistic as any of his solo albums, and he's done it with his band. I think that's great. The more I listen to it, the more I love it. I hope the same happens for you. If you listen to it once and you don't get it, just do me a favor and listen to it a couple more times. I know that's hard to do, but maybe it'll sink in, maybe it won't. Try that with a movie too one time. All your friends say a movie's great and you watch it once. Maybe you're in a bad mood. Maybe there wasn't the night to watch it. Go watch it again at some point. If you're friends with these people and you like all the same things, the recommendation was probably solid. You probably weren't into it at that time. So this is kind of to counter those people who just dismiss this album on listening to it once. I could not do that. I, I, I'm a huge fan of the band and listening to it once. I just, I didn't, you know, I, I didn't have an opinion. I didn't have an opinion. After a week's worth, I couldn't tell you specifically about too many of the songs. I am letting it seep into my soul because I have almost 20 years of listening to all their other stuff. So I'm I'm personally finding where this fits. But I know right now, I haven't switched out the CD in over a week in my car, and I'm not going to. I got a lot more listening to do before I move on to something else. And I've been listening to the new Ghost album, uh, the new Molly Barron album, and a few other things, because I like pretty rockin' stuff in the car. But Porcupine Tree released a new album. If you didn't see the other day, Mike Portnoy called it Album of the Year, no contest. Several other people have called it that. Some of my friends who are actual music reviewers said, I hope I don't lose any friends, but I was disappointed in it. One of the big reviewers... Um, uh, it wasn't Pitchfork, it was, but it was one of those kind of indie mags. They were like, eh, it's, it doesn't connect, it's not emotional, it's, it's cold. 
I think there's some of the most passionate vocals that Stephen has ever done. I think there's some really passionate guitar playing and drumming, some really interesting keyboardy stuff. No, I'm, I can't say this is cold at all. Maybe it hit me cold the first time, a couple of the songs. But that was more my perceptions, more my expectations than what I was actually hearing. And now that I'm letting it happen, whew, what an album this is. Anyway. I'll get back to, like I said, a formal review at some point, but give this album a couple of listens and then get back to me and let me know what you think. I'm Scott Hamilton. I'm Rockfile. My links are below. Thanks for being a part of this. This turned out to be a long one. I really didn't know what I was going to say, so hey, happy journey, right? Thanks for listening. (laughs) 